Hi and welcome to Mammograms and Me from metro.co.uk. This is a new podcast series all about my campaign to find the million missing mammograms and the thousands of women walking around with undiagnosed breast cancer. Hosted by me, Dawn Butler, first elected in 2005, I launched the hashtag Find the Million campaign with metro.co.uk in 2022 because after my own diagnosis, I was shocked to find out that there was between 8,000 and 10,000 women walking around with breast cancer and they just didn't know it. Each week, I'll be speaking to experts, doctors, and people with a deep understanding of breast cancer and some people who are still on their journey. I'll be discussing their experiences, the inside story, and what we can all look out for. So, this week, I have got the amazing Liz Ariadne. She's a cancer survivor, an author of Under the Knife, and a former breast cancer surgeon. Liz, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Dawn, and this is such an important issue to be talking about. It is, and you've had like your journey from, it's almost like behind the camera and in front of the camera, but worst case scenario, you were a surgeon and then a patient. But like before we get into all of that, I think you've you've turned into um, an online kind of social media phenomenon, telling your story, your distinctive glasses, yeah. which I yeah. absolutely love your glasses. Where do you get your glasses from? <laughs> They're gorgeous. They are 3D printed um, from an optician called the Eye Company in Soho. Oh, wow. Yeah, they are so cool. So very distinctive. And you do sort of amazing things on social media, kind of talking people through in a sort of clear everyday terms because it is very daunting and the excitement the other day when you talked about um this new vaccine you literally came to life on screen you were like oh my god there's this new vaccine and it is so um important uh, to the fight against breast cancer tell me a little bit more and the listeners a little bit more about this uh, vaccine so this is really exciting for anyone who has HER2 positive cancer, and that's one of three receptors we test every breast cancer cell for. And about 30% of women have HER2 positive receptors, and this is a vaccine that can attack it and potentially kill them. But at the moment, it's just been trialed in women with metastatic breast cancer where it's come back. But if this trial works and rolls out, it could be another thing we can give to women right up front to hopefully stop their cancer never spreading. It's incredible. It really, really is a game changer. And people, you know, we're used to vaccines now, you know, COVID, you know, we're used to like DNA, RNA. We're used to sort of talking about vaccines a little bit. Um, what makes this so exciting? And is it something that's been in development for a long time? I think it's taken almost 10 years to develop this vaccine, which targets the HER2 receptor on breast cancer cells. And HER2 positive cancers can spread to the brain. Um, they can come back. They can be fast growing. But this vaccine may mean that we have a treatment to give women up front. So they need a lot fewer treatments like chemotherapy and they have a chance of surviving breast cancer. And it's just incredible to think if this vaccine works, where could we go next to help stop every breast cancer? Forming? And that would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? I, I almost wished, so I was going to say, I wish that my job didn't exist mm. and that there was a cure for breast cancer and you didn't need people like yeah. me. And um, is this vaccine given to people then before, so it's preventative or can it be given during or after? breast cancer diagnosis at the moment at the moment it's only given to women with her two positive breast cancer that is spread so it's incurable and they're testing on these women to see is it shrinking the tumors are they living for far longer than expected and if that works they will then roll it out and hopefully helpfully give it to people who are diagnosed primarily with breast cancer i think we're a long way from being able to prevent it completely because there are so many different types mm. but finding a cure for one type is just amazing yeah i mean i i'm i'm really excited about that like there is absolute hope and uh, there really is and how about the different kinds because as you said there's lots of different kinds of breast cancer um there's yeah. the early stage breast cancer like what I had um there's like late stage breast cancer there's still breast cancers that they don't know about I mean I was tested for mm -hmm. the gene and family history and 
I haven't got the gene, but my mum yeah. had breast cancer and my sister had breast cancer. So when people say, well, why don't we know more about breast cancer? What's, what's with your surgeon hat on? What's, what's yes. that about? So I think it's very complex and there are lots of different ways of describing it. You can describe breast cancer as early breast cancer that is confined to the breast or breast cancer that is spread, which is stage four or metastatic or advanced, and that means it's incurable. You can then describe breast cancer by the tissue in the breast it's come from, and that can be ductal cancer coming from the ducts that take milk to your nipple, or lobular cancer that comes from the tissue that form milk, or inflammatory breast cancer that is in the lymph vessels in the skin of the breast. Then you can split all of those cancers up into the receptors they have for estrogen, progesterone and herceptin. It's so complex. Mm -hmm. And we don't know why some women in their 20s get breast cancer than some women in their 80s do. We know there are lots of things that can increase the risk of you getting it. And genetics is actually only about 5 to 10% of all breast cancers. So you mentioned the BRCA gene, mm -hmm. and that is one of four or five genes we know about that can be passed down from families and increase your risk of getting breast cancer. So it's, such a, it's a small percentage, isn't it? Five percent is a small percentage. It's a really small percentage, yeah. yeah. And incurable breast cancer, does that mean, mm -hmm. if you get that diagnosis, does that mean your, what's your life expectancy? So the life expectancy of incurable breast cancer is, is lower than a normal woman. I think the average is three to five years, but that's taking every woman with every different type of breast cancer. There are some women living 10, 12 years, like Chris Halenga, who founded Copperfield. But if it's spread beyond the breast, and some women are diagnosed in the beginning with incurable breast cancer, it means it can't be cured. We give you treatments to slow down the growth and hopefully keep it stable. But in time, the cancers develop resistance to each new treatment until you run out. Wow. And they call that kind of lines, don't they? Like they they put you on a treatment they do. and then you yes. follow that treatment to the end of that line and then they try another treatment. Where do you think the vaccine will come That's in a bit... that treatment? I'm hoping the vaccine could be the first line of treatment. If we say someone has a HER2 positive cancer, then they get this vaccine and hopefully that's it. And if that doesn't work, then add in something else. Mm. And our bodies are quite quite resilient aren't they so is that why yeah. kind of the body will then fight back or the the cancer still grows because they get used to used to the treatment i think cancers develop resistance to drugs it's just what happens they are continually mutating and changing the dna inside the cells is damaged and one drug will work for a while you'll get three or four cancer cells that just resist it and then they'll grow and form another clone. And that's the problem. It's not one disease we're treating, it's a disease that's constantly changing. And that's why we need these different lines of treatment. The hope is something like a vaccine would just kill them all to start with so you don't need other lines. Mm, that would be incredible. It would be amazing. And you talked about younger women um, being diagnosed. Uh, I remember when I was going through my treatment, it, the, the my breast cancer nurse was saying how they're seeing younger and younger women come in. Yeah. Um, and as you say, there are very many factors that might contribute. What What is the Sarah Harding? Uh, there was a campaign because Sarah died quite young. What What is that? There was. So Sarah Harding wanted to leave a legacy to try and help breast cancer and younger women. And they've set up a trial to try and identify which young women are more likely to get breast cancer set up in Manchester looking at a thousand women and what they're doing is getting a saliva sample of women just to see if they can detect genetic mutations in that saliva. They're also doing blood tests and they're looking at their mammogram density to see if they can find an algorithm or a pattern to tell us which young women are more likely to get breast cancer because at the moment we don't know. It's bad luck, it's chance. We can't say you're going to get it and you're not. Yeah, but we know there are things you can do to reduce your risk, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, like exercising and staying healthy. But I did all of that and I've had it three times. So any information is going to really help us in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. That's an amazing study. And they will follow these thousand women for their lifetime. 
Yes, I think they are for good. Let me just see. Yes, they're going to follow them up for their life just to see what happens to them. They will all get a breast cancer risk assessment and they'll see what happens. And as the information comes in, it'll be more and more accurate. And hopefully this could be rolled out to every year woman. Oh. Once you reach the age of 20 or 30, you could have these three simple tests done. And if we know you're at a higher risk, then we can give you lifestyle advice, maybe suggest mammograms at an earlier age to catch breast cancer at an earlier stage. I think that's I think that's really like the future of medicine, the NHS, this yeah. personalized care. So everybody's sort of getting a risk assessment and then, you know, making an, a, a plan, a health plan from, from there on in. It's a really important trial. Oh, we'll have to, we'll have to Definitely. follow that closely. Yeah, no, it's really exciting. But I always wonder if someone had told me when I was young that drinking alcohol could cause breast cancer. I drank a lot at medical school. Mm. But to give you that information at an early stage so you can make decisions that could affect your future, it would be amazing. Because yeah. it, it is part of it, isn't it? Alcohol, eating bacon. <laughs> Not processed food as much. So this is a real myth. Processed food doubles your risk of getting breast cancer. The study showed, I think you had to be eating sausage and bacon three times a day for a couple of months to increase your right. risk. And a little bit of everything once in a while is fine. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? It's like, um, yeah, it's like, as you say, a little bit of everything, because otherwise, what's life? What would life be like? And depression, exactly. depression and stress, has an effect on the body that doctors can't explain. So we have to make sure that we live a happy life too. But you were super you fit, right? You, I was. I was a triathlete. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I knew you rode a bike. Yeah, I just done my first triathlon about five months before I was diagnosed. Um, so you're super fit. But I believe the ex So you're super fit. I was super fit. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what was your lifestyle like? Did you drink? Did you eat meat? So my, I was pretty boring. I was a surgeon um, working long hours. Um, when my husband wasn't, was on call, I would just eat bagels and cereal. My diet wasn't great. Fruit and vegetables wasn't something I, knew, I saw a lot of. Bacon sandwiches, thank <laughs> you very much. I didn't drink a lot of alcohol, mainly because... Um, I was working a lot, so my husband and I didn't really drink at home. Um, I never checked my breasts. I never examined them because I never thought I would get so it. Hang on, Liz. You're a breast cancer yeah. surgeon. And yes. you never checked your breasts. No. How, what's that? How? I never what? checked them. Why? I think most women listening do not check their breasts every month. And it's often only when someone is diagnosed in the media or a friend is diagnosed, you might give them a quick feel. I never did it. I'm young. I've got no family history. I'm fit. It's not going to happen to me. And I woke up one day and I noticed a lump in the mirror and that was it. So, um, so you noticed a lump. So, but you, so you looked, so you I looked did. at your breast. So although you didn't examine your breast regularly, which yeah. everybody would think a breast cancer surgeon knows, you know, knows all of the pitfalls, what to do and how to examine. Yeah. Everybody would think that you would be like exemplar in that but you were busy as well just doing your job and thinking that you're never going to get yeah. it but you must have been looking at your breasts every day to notice a lump not not looking at them I, it was just I got out of the shower and I was drying my hair and I just noticed a lump in my cleavage in the mirror and a lot of women just suddenly notice a lump that they swear wasn't there yesterday and I say it's a bit like when you're pregnant. Breast cancers often grow really slowly. It can take five or 10 years to become a lump you can feel. Like when women are pregnant, they're flat and then they suddenly start showing. And it's almost as if that cancer has doubled in size overnight so you can suddenly feel it. Wow. Or you can suddenly see wow. it. I didn't look at my breasts every day in the mirror to see, can I see a cancer? I, it just caught my eye. Wow. And then what happened? I thought it was just a cyst because I'd had a couple of cysts before and I've got expert hands and I thought I knew what it was. My, I had a mammogram, I was 40 and it was normal. I had dense breasts. I then had an ultrasound and I saw a cancer. And two weeks later, I was having chemotherapy for a stage three cancer. And then I had a mastectomy and radiotherapy. And I realized I knew nothing about breast cancer at all. Wow. And did you see the scan? So when... Did you, so you, yes, did you I diagnose did. yourself? Oh my yeah, God. so I do ultrasounds myself in clinic right. and I was having the ultrasound scan and I looked at the screen because I'm nosy and I thought, oh, that's a cancer. Wow. I didn't need to wait for my her to do a biopsy or my surgeon to come in. I knew it was big. 
I knew I'd need chemotherapy. I had a good idea what my 10 year survival would be based on the size and my age. And it was too much information. And I had to decide how much of that do I tell my husband and my mum because I knew too much. And all that was going and that was through your head at that moment. Yeah. Immediately. When you say big, how big is big? So it was it was two and a half or three centimetres on the ultrasound scan. And then I had an MRI which showed it was actually five and a half centimetres. But when after my mastectomy and chemo, there was actually 13 centimetres of lobular cancer left in my breast. It was one of those weird ones that aren't seen on any scans. So That's the thing, isn't it? it? When they have an operation, then when they go in, they see more. So what's, yeah. what they can see on the screen isn't necessarily the whole story. So my cancer, it's, when they went in, they, yeah. they said to me, hidden underneath it was a very inv invasive yeah. stage four cancer, which yeah. was hiding underneath. Yeah. Sometimes we can feel more when we're inside the breast tissue and other times the pathologists can see more when they look at the specimen under the microscope. So no scan is perfect. So you're looking at the screen the person mm -hmm. still taking the scan. Did you know the person that was doing your scan? Yes, okay. I did. I'd worked in that breast unit as a junior doctor, so everybody knew me. How did that feel, having that scan with your peers? Like They were, they were wonderful. Um, I think when they realised that this was more serious than they thought, you could feel the, the emotion in the room change. And everyone suddenly, oh my goodness, we all know it's cancer. Before they did the biopsy, my surgeon who trained me came in and said, right, who do you want to look after you? Because I'm not sure I can because you're a friend. And it was just that it's one of our own. Mm. And I suddenly realized I had to stop being in control. Mm. And I had to let other people tell me what to do and how to look after me. And yes, I talk about chemotherapy, but I'd never had it. And that fear of is it going to come back? Am I going to die? What's going to happen? Can I carry on working? Suddenly, all these emotions that I had no idea my patients went through were going through my head. So it just came to life. And what did it, what did it feel like? Did you think, like your head must have been all over the place? I know when I received my diagnosis, I didn't yeah. hear beyond, you've got cancer. No, I didn't hear anything no, else beyond that. You but don't. to but with you and all your information and knowledge, you must have had yeah. a thousand and one things going through your head from diagnosis to operation to outcome. I did, but I knew it all. And I still can only remember hearing it's cancer. And all I wanted to do was to run out of that room swearing and screaming and just find a bit of private space. And I heard my surgeon tell me what was going to happen. I thought, God, this sounds really scary when you're on the mm. other side. And I was just a vulnerable frightened patient, mm. terrified about what was going to happen to me. And it was, it wasn't a fun place to be. And I still think part of me is in denial. Mm. I got through chemo by writing about it to make it seem real, but I still part of me thinks I've not had it three times. Mm. It can't be real. I'm too scared about what might happen. So I kind of block it out so I can just focus on getting through each day. And I, I can't believe you've had it three times because actually you had a double mastectomy you the, just the a single, mastectomy. single mastectomy sorry yeah so you had a single mastectomy and you went flat and and I, thought, I did eventually I thought, yeah well then if you've gone flat then it will be fine yeah no so I initially had an implant mastectomy where they where they kept my nipples so the breast tissue escaped was scooped away and after a mastectomy even though we remove all the breast tissue that we can see and feel, you can't remove every single microscopic cell. It's a bit like peeling an orange. You can't get rid of all the pith. And despite radiotherapy and a mastectomy, there's still between a 2 and 10% chance of getting a little breast cancer deposit in the skin of the breast tissue. Now, I had a nodule that happened about three years later on my chest wall, just on the edge of the mastectomy. So I went flat to have that local recurrence excised. And then... Two or three days ago, I found another, I had surgery for another nodule that just appeared in the skin. It doesn't happen very often, but it's why even after breast cancer surgery, women still need to check their breast skin and look in the mirror, looking for little lumps and bumps that could be a local recurrence. Are women told that? Because I'm not sure that women are told that really. I, I think women yeah. are told when they have a mastectomy that 
you know, you're dismissed. Like I was, I'm dismissed from my uh, yep. breast cancer appointments. They were like, we no longer need to see you. So if somebody dismisses yep. you, you think, well, I'm, I'm good. I know. And it's a bit like so many women don't realize that their breast cancer can come back 30 years in the future. Mm. I think for me, the issue is this. As a breast surgeon, I would have a 10 minutes to tell you, this is the results of your cancer. This is what you're having done. This is the future. I don't have time to go in every little thing. And that's why we're given piles of leaflets. Mm. The Breast Cancer Now leaflet telling you about the risks of recurrence or secretary. So all these piles of leaflets that a lot of women just go home and Too don't much. read. And when when do you tell someone, yes, it's cured, it's great, off you go, but it might come back, you need to check. It's really hard to hear that as a patient. Mm. And I think we need to make sure women know at some point along the way that they need to keep checking, but it's are they ready to hear it and who do they hear it from? And I think that's why I kind of do what I do to bridge that gap between what doctors have the time to tell you and what you might not realise you need to do. And I think you do that so phenomenally well I mean it's so important because there's too much information and when you've got when you're going through it and you have to survive it then that's your focus and you know you said you were thinking how are you going to tell your husband and your mum I mean all of that information as somebody going through cancer we have to go through, we think, oh, how are other people going to cope with hearing the news? How am I going to manage their expectations? How did you do that? Because you had, as you say, you had both sides. How did you do that? I, I remember when I told my mum that I got breast cancer and she said, why aren't you crying? You sound like you're talking about a patient. Where is your emotion? And I think that was my way of dealing with it. It wasn't happening to me. It was happening to someone else so I could cope. But it was quite hard for my husband to understand the side effects of tamoxifen and chemotherapy, the impact the menopause is going to have on my life and trying to explain, I'm not become a crazy woman because I don't like you and I'm not turned on because I don't like you. It's, it's because of what is happening to me. And I think patients are expected to go and explain everything the doctor said to their family, but they're not doctors. Mm. And that's why I think we should be digitally signposting patients, giving them safe resources. You're going to go on Google, send your family here so they can read what is happening to you and you can have a break. Yeah. And the other um, good bit of information uh, I heard is always you can assign somebody to to tell. Yes. People. So, you know, so you'd sort of tell one person. Yeah. And then everyone else you say, can you go and speak to yeah. X? X will fill you in. So then you don't have to repeat it over yeah. and over again because it's very traumatizing it isn't is it? you're reliving everyone else's emotion they're crying their fear their shock every mm. time you tell them i don't need to go through this again so that is a brilliant idea to have one person as a gatekeeper mm. yeah and tamoxifen yes um and when the doctor said to me i had to go on tamoxifen i was like well what's the percentage of me like getting you know cancer again i didn't want to like pop yeah. pills you know, for five years or 10 years. And then all of the side effects. I didn't want to read about the side effects. Mm -hmm. You know, the medically induced menopause. Um, as you say, the mood swings. I didn't want to do any of that. I didn't want to read it. I just wanted to look. I've had my operation. I had breast cancer. You caught it. It's out. I've had reconstruction. Let me get on with my life I'm now. Done. Forget yeah. all about it. Yeah. But that's not the case. No. And it, it took me a while to get my head around the fact that Dawn, this is to help you. So you need to be taking uh, tamoxifen or whatever medication other patients are given. But bloody hell, there's a lot of side effects. There are. And I, so we give, we give tamoxifen or other drugs to stop the breast cancer coming back and it reduces that risk by up to a half. I used to tell women, you might have hot flushes for a couple of months and a bit of vaginal dryness, but it'll wear off. They never told me what it was really like, and I never had the time to ask. And then at the age of 40, I went into an instant menopause. And this is the thing. When you've had breast cancer, it happens overnight. It's not that three or four slow decline. And it was really, 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 really hard. And I think one of the problems is a lot of women who struggle are talking about it on social media. So we don't hear from the women who actually are okay with it and don't have a rough ride. But if you are struggling, it's really, really hard. 
The great thing is now there are lots of drugs that you can have as an alternative to HRT to help with the hot flushes and the night sweats. There are lots of things you can do now to help with symptoms such as exercise and diet things to help your sex life. But when you are taking a tablet every day for 10 years and it's giving you joint pain or leg swelling or brain fog, it's really miserable because you just want to move on with your life and think, I don't want to feel like this. It's not fair. Yeah. And... um. It was actually one of your videos where, because I went to the doctor and I said, like, I've been diagnosed with frozen shoulder mm -hmm. and carpal Aww. tunnel. And and I'm like, it's the meds. I know it's the meds. But it was really interesting because I think different brands of tamoxifen uh, reacted differently. They to do. Me. So was a, and some pharmacists... Because I know I've had an argument with my pharmacist almost, and I'm like, you need to get this brand because this is the one that works with me. This brand, I'm in pain. Like I was in pain. I couldn't get yeah. out of bed for two days. So, But it was almost like you're made to feel that you're over-exaggerating. Yeah. And I, I why didn't. Why don't they know this? I didn't believe it. There is no reason why a different brand should make some women feel great and some women feel awful because they've all got the same drug. And then someone told me to try it and I didn't. Oh my God. And I can't explain it, but it works. But I think as a scientist, you think, why would a different food coloring in a tablet suddenly take away half the symptoms? It doesn't make sense. And it's really hard to get your symptoms listened to. And I think someone who hasn't had diarrhea can say, well, that's just mild. Whereas if you're having torrential diarrhea, it's really bad. And it's like that common perception of pain. And that's where for me, talking to other women online and realizing I'm not alone and this is what people are going through. and This is what can help. It's just a lifesaver for me. So, and so, so if you're the, the surgeon and now the patient, mm. so you know that as a surgeon, you didn't believe it. That's right. How would you now as a patient convince the surgeon, convince Liz the surgeon, look, I know you're busy. I know, you've, I know you're going to do amazing things yeah. for the next patient coming behind me. I know that and I want you to like do your best because you're kind of mindful and you must be especially mindful, like you know how busy that's. Are. So how do you convince the surgeon like that yeah. this is a real thing? This isn't in our heads. I think it's saying... I've done a lot of research and I've spoken to a lot of women online and breast cancer forums and a lot of them say changing the brand of tamoxifen can make a difference and I'd like to try it. And I think most GPs or pharmacists would say, well, I don't believe you, but let's give it a go and see. It's hard just because to keep... just, to, just to keep trying and say, I want to try different brands to see if it makes a difference. Yeah, it really does. And sex and yes. menopause. I mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's, Everybody talks about the menopause now, don't they? Which is a good thing. It's, it is. You know, it's on TV shows. I know. It's on but your soaps. I think it's hard you know, for women like us that. when we don't have a natural menopause and HRT is a last resort and you kind of feel like no one gives a toss about us, but we need help. And I'll mm. tell you, when I was diagnosed, I wanted my husband to go divorce me and marry a woman with two healthy little breasts and a libido. Because did I you say that to him? I did. I felt guilty about the impact that my breast cancer diagnosis was having on our intimate relationship. And so many women have told me the same. And I had no idea how big an impact it could have. And I'd only been married for a couple of years. Goodness knows how hard it is for women who are young and single or dating. But there is stuff mm. you can do to help get your sex life back. Mm. And is it important? Is it important to worry about your sex life? I think if it's important to you, then it's important to worry about. And it's a basic human need. It's like a basic quality of life. And connecting can be a really important way to feel close to your partner. And for some people, they may say, I don't need to have penetrative sex. That's fine. Cuddles and massaging and hugging is fine, mm. although you can't spoon anymore because of the night sweats. But it's really hard when your hormones are turned off and you, you have no libido. You literally never want to have sex again. And that can be really hard for partners to understand because they can feel you're rejecting them and you're not. You just don't feel that way anymore. Mm. And you're going through a lot. You are. And this, I didn't look at myself from the neck down when I went flat. Mm. I hated my body. I hated the scars. I don't, I don't want to touch myself. I don't want my husband to touch me. To let mm. someone be intimate with you, you've got to accept your new body and that can be really hard as well 
Yeah. And we talked about this in in some other episodes as mm-hmm. well in terms of how we need to learn to love our body yes. from an early age. Because the fact is, is that there's always something wrong with our bodies. There's always something that we don't like. Yeah. And so when you have something as major as a surgery on something that's sexualized, like our breasts and our mm. boobs, you know, it, it has a lot of um, a lot of mental health issues for a lot of women. Yeah. Um, how was is, how is your, like... And I understand that as well, like not wanting to look at your body or clothes. Yeah. I mean, your clothes fit you a certain way. Then all of a sudden, your body has completely changed. Your clothes looks different. So your favorite dress that you once had, that was your go-to. Oh, I know. Dress, you, don't, you don't like yourself in it no. anymore. So I, all that has to change. I struggled losing my hair because I was known for having lots of big, long, wavy hair. And I still don't recognize photos of me bald. When I went flat, I remember walking around a department store crying, thinking I need to find clothes with ruffles over the left shoulder to distract it. I couldn't wear a bra because of chronic post-op pain and there was nothing. And I thought I'm just going to be walking around like a hunchback with my shoulders closed and no one looks at me. I can't look at myself. I can never flirt again. I felt I was no longer a woman. But time has been a huge healer. And now I can walk around I'm very lucky I only have a small breast on the other side, but I realize everyone's concerned about how big their bum is. No one's really looking at me. And I've had to accept this is me. Yes, I get cleavage envy when I see a young girl on the tube and think, oh my goodness, I want to be able to have a push-up bra like you. But this is me now. And I've had to learn what suits me, what kind of clothes I can't wear and say goodbye to a load of stuff because this is who I am now. And I'm almost mm. proud of what my body can achieve, but it took five years to be able to accept Yes, it's not fair, but you can't turn back the clock. And this is what you have now. And I think that's a powerful lesson. And This Is Me is like one of my favorite songs and the greatest show. Yes, yes. This is me. I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars. It's like no more. You know, this is me. This is who I am. And I think that's a powerful message for anybody going through. And I, and I think you're right. Time is a healer. It's very different, I think, to grief because... You know, people say time's a healer, but I, I think, I think that I not, I don't feel that actually, because I still grieve the loss of my dad like it was yesterday. Yeah, no, me too. Just, I, I cope with it a little bit better, but it's not healing. I'm not healing. No. Um, maybe but I think it's acceptance. I think grief, maybe. grief is always with you. Mm. But I think you can yeah. accept what you look like and what's happened. I mean, I get still, I fertility. Chemo stopped me having children. I've really wanted them. Whenever it's book day on Facebook, I'm still, oh my goodness. But my body, I've learned to accept. This is it. I can't change it. I have to move on. Yeah, I agree. I'm very much the same. I'm like, right, this is my body. And I love my body. You know, I love it now how it is. I had a dear flatter stomach. You know, and yeah. it's like I've accepted big surgery yeah, though, big, massive, massive surgery, big recovery. Massive. It's not as I used to describe it to patients as you get a tummy tuck and a boob job. I was an idiot. <laughs> it is nothing like that. We're not making a boob. We're putting tissue on the chest to fill a bra. And I'm sorry to every woman I said that to. Um, <laughs> it's making me laugh because <laughs> because I said to my surgeon, I'm having a tummy tuck. You know, this is how I'm going to make myself feel better. And he's like, you're not having a tummy tuck. This is not a tummy tuck. And I'm like, yeah. I'm going to eat McDonald's in Kentucky and I'm going to, because you're going to take it all out. And that was my thing. And uh, you're yeah. absolutely right. It is not. And, you know, it couldn't, I couldn't walk. It was 10 hours. I was under for 10 hours. Yeah. Huge surgery. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's not, it's not a tummy tuck and a boob job for sure. But yeah, accepting our bodies is something that I think we should never stop talking about. And no. No, Do you wish no. you'd known that when you were 20? Oh, yeah. Do you wish you were with your body now? 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. I wish I was as fat now as I was when I was 20 years old because, you know, you think you're fat and you're really not fat, you know. And so it's like, yes, 20 years ago, I'd be like, 
you know, you work it, girlfriend, you know, and... Accept it. Yeah. You know, everyone's got cellulite and stretch marks and no one yeah. likes themselves, and but nobody cares. It's just how we need to change that, don't we? That's right. The, these conversations need to happen because when things happen to us and our bodies change a lot, they change from, you know, from where young to puberty to going through the menopause, it changes. And that's something that we have to accept and not look down on it to think... Oh, right. Okay. You've got a wrinkle. That's the end of the world. I know. No. Stop with all the anti-aging. Yeah, I'm changing. proud to age. Yeah. For me, getting older is going to be great because it means I've not died of breast cancer. I like my wrinkles. That's I don't right. want to get rid of them. That's right. It means that we're, we're living another day. So I think the more conversations we have around that, the better. And I hope that, you know, this podcast, that people will be, they'll learn a lot, but they'll be just engaged and enthused about sort of living living life and living another day and knowing yeah. that breast cancer isn't the death sentence that it once was nope. and I hope that that I hope people get that message across I hope we get that message across with people and if you could go back um as a surgeon what else would you do differently going having been through your experience oh I think I would make sure that my patients had more information about how to cope when I said goodbye. Talking about the mental health, the anxiety, depression, PTSD that can happen, making sure they knew how to check about the symptoms of recurrence, making sure someone was talking to them about their sex life and how to cope with the side effects of the drugs. I think there's not a lot of joined up thinking at the moment between oncologists and nurses and GPs. And again, helping them find safe resources online that will give them good information so they feel empowered and they feel in control fantastic and tell me a little bit more about under the knife so i was fascinated by medical dramas at school you know gray's anatomy and casualty and healthy city i was obsessed Mm. oh god amazing Mm. amazing and i think the public have always had a fascination with how you train to become a doctor. And there aren't any books written by female surgeons. And I wanted to let people into my world about what it's like to be given a scalpel and told, cut into this 11 year old boy, take his appendix out. What will the skin feel like? What do you go through? Then I thought there's so much that has happened to me in my life. The depression that I went through as a doctor dealing with telling 10 women a day they have breast cancer and then going on the other side. And I thought, if I can just let people into my world and share what I've been through and show them how I've coped, it's another way for me to help people since I had to stop being a surgeon when my cancer came back. And did you suffer from depression before you were diagnosed with breast cancer? Yeah. So I had depression all the way through medical school oh, wow. um, and I never talked about it. I was scared that my colleagues would find out, my bosses would know I wouldn't be trusted. Um, And I had tablets and some therapy. And then as a consultant surgeon, um, I was suicidal twice, just through the stress of being a cancer surgeon and dealing with everything that involves. Because we don't get coaching, we don't get counseling, you don't get told how to cope with telling a pregnant woman she's got incurable disease. And that was really, really hard because I felt guilty. I thought, why? It's it's my fault for getting depression and I've got nothing to worry about. And that, that stigma, and I just thought, off the back of COVID, when everyone's talking about how hard it is to be a doctor in those times, I want to come out and say, it can happen to all of us. Mm. Um, And I'd just gone back to work for about three months after my last bout of suicidal depression when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. And then I got depression for a whole new reason, for that fear of it coming back and the anxiety that we live with. And I think we need to make it normal to talk about this so people know they're not alone. And how do you cope with your depression? I take tablets, which also help with the hot flushes. I have talking therapy when I need it. But for me, it's all about nature. I can't do mindfulness. I can't decide at 10 o'clock in the morning, it's my 10 minutes to be happy. But going outside, walking the dog, feeding the birds, just switching off. That's what brings me back. That and exercise, because when I'm exercising, I'm just Liz. Mm. I'm not patient. It's just me getting out there, hitting the streets. And that's what helps keep me grounded. Yeah. What about you? How do you cope with anxiety? Um, I, I, I don't know how I cope most days, if I'm fair and honest. Mm-hmm. I think I wish I exercised more. Um, it's always that number one thing that they say, you know, like if you're feeling tired, go exercise, even though it's the last thing you want to do. And I'm thinking, yeah, I really don't want to do it. I want to just sit on the sofa and eat a pack of crisps. And so it's it's difficult. But I do think that being grateful you know 
that does help. Yeah. But being being mindful about my surroundings, uh, ensuring that you've got good people around you is really important for me because it you know it is tough like for you telling people that they had cancer as a surgeon was really difficult for me dealing with people's problems every day yeah. is like really tough especially when you kind of become overly invested like in my constituents I'm just like oh my god I need to I need to sort this out for them and yeah. so you need to have that uh, release and you know, I do like a glass of wine sometimes, meal or vodka and diet coke, or a skinny bitch. But my office says I'm not allowed to call it that. But that's now what's a that's skinny the bitch? Name of the cocktail. Oh, is that vodka and diet coke? Oh, okay. It's vodka and vodka soda and limes. It's supposed to be less calories. Okay. It's what the models drink. So, um, so that that kind of helps. But I did find that when I was writing my book, A Purposeful Life, so that helped me when I was coping with cancer when I couldn't walk. Um, just writing things down and then journeying yeah. back through my life uh, through writing the book was just phenomenal because it just pieced bits together. And I think when you when you do that, when you take time to write, do a blog, what you're doing is you're thinking out loud, but you're also consolidating those thoughts and you're sort of making things work for you so that you can get yeah. up another day and, and live another moment. And they almost become less scary when you write them down, don't they? Yeah, because you're halfway through solving it if you write it down mm. because you started to think about the solution to the problem. And so I think that's really important for people to do. So, but hold your book up. Let's do a, let's do a hold up our book. I will book. do. Let's yes, do a, hold a, up a book. book. Here we go. Here we go. So under the knife. And is that... And look, you match your background. I know. I know. I've got a whole new wardrobe to match my book cover. <laughs> <laughs> so um and is that is that stitches on the on your book yes it is because i i sew my own clothes and i was a surgeon so it's like a needle going through skin or fabric oh wow um, also does that yeah. mean that your patients that their scars were just really neat and perfect yes because i my last year of training was in plastic surgeons at the royal marsden where they actually teach you how to sew skin which is the first thing you learn but when you learn to do it properly and the scar is invisible oh, oh. i've had women flash me in supermarkets to say look you can't see the scar yeah i can imagine because that's the thing isn't it like the people that have had stuff done to their boobs you really do don't mind showing it off to people who know about no you know boobs are like oh look at mine exactly Nicole, or, look at my scar or... and i've always thought i can do anything inside your breast to rearrange it but all you see is the scar mm. yeah and that that's the rep my handiwork my reputation is based on how good that scar is so i always used to take my time over it oh that's amazing uh, i bet there's a, thousands of women who are who are thankful to you right now every time they look in a mirror and see their beautifully uh formed new boob so liz, ha liz hashtag find the million missing mammograms i think that's how we first communicated i think i yeah i i sent you a message over social media because i saw that you were doing some like amazing sort of videos and stuff um we're we're getting people we're getting women that are uh going for their mammograms and catching it early which is the whole point it's of brilliant. the campaign yeah um I, I know we're nowhere close to the million but we're in the hundreds i think we could be in the thousands we're yeah we could be in the thousands because some people will go for their mammogram and not say which is perfectly okay um but just how important is it to to have a mammogram for me, having a mammogram is not just about saving lives. It's about reducing the amount of treatment the women need. The earlier we catch your breast cancer, the less likely you are to need a mastectomy, the less likely you are to need chemotherapy, the longer you're likely to live. And to me, that's one of the biggest reasons that women should have it done. We still don't have a test that can pick it up. And mammogram is all we have that's available. So I would urge anyone, when you get to the age of a screening mammogram, go and have it done. And would you recommend mammograms? I mean, I what's happened to this Maria uh, campaign? I've discussed this a bit. I really want to do more on the on the Maria, which is a new way of kind of scanning for breast cancer. But OK, so for those people that are listening on audio, how do you examine your breasts? So I have a video on my YouTube channel, which will take you through it. But the first thing you do is you look in the mirror and you look to see if there are any lumps or dimples or if your nipple is pulled in. Then you put your hands above your head 
and your hands on your waist and push in. And what that does is lift the breast tissue off the chest wall. And you can sometimes see little dimples or tethers. So you do your hands up cancers. first and then ha down. Hands up above your head right, and, and then your hands on your hips and push in. Right, okay. And what that is doing is lifting the breast tissue off the chest wall. And if there's a cancer there pulling tissue in, you will see a dimple or a tether appear. You may also see your nipples start to pull in. Then what you do is you lie back at about 30 degrees, so not standing up. You lie either in bed on a couple of pillows or in the bath. And with the flat of your hand, so if you imagine all your fingers bending at the palm, with the flat of the backs of your fingers, you are going to push your breast tissue against your rib cage. And if you imagine your breast is a clock, you need to go all the way around the clock from the outside into the middle. And there's a little bit that goes from the breast to the armpit. And you just push the breast tissue down really firmly trying to see if you can feel a lump between your fingers and your rib cage. If you do it standing up and you have large breasts, what happens is your breasts will hang and fold over and you're feeling a double thickness and all breast surgeons and doctors feel you lying down. Wow. And um, how long should it take? Literally a minute or two. It doesn't take long. If you feel a lumpy area in one side, check the other side because often that's the same. And you should do it, if you are still having periods, you should do it in the middle of your cycle. Why? Not the first of the month. In the middle of your cycle, it's when your hormone levels are at the lowest and your breasts are less lumpy and less painful and they're easier to examine. If you've gone through the menopause, then the first of the month is fine. But if you're young, do it in mid-cycle. And do it every month so you know what's normal for you, so it's easy to pick up a change. I was going to say, should people set an alarm on their phone and just say like, I do. Quick, quick check. Yeah. I do now. I examine my normal breasts the first of the month because I've been through the menopause, but otherwise mid-cycle. And it's and like we should check our pee and our poo. We should check on moles. We could check on mouse. Just a general check for red flag symptoms because we could have any number of cancers lurking and, and we're not taught to screen for them. Yeah. And we can do a lot of that screening ourselves. Mm. But but also go for the mammogram because mine didn't present as a lump. So yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, Liz, uh, you have been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to reading your book and congratulations on your book. Thank you. And uh, I'll send you a copy of mine. A no, please line. do. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> so we can read each other's book and do a critique. We'll have another conversation after that. But um, I'm wishing you all the best of health. I know like July is a very difficult month for you as well, but yeah. I'm really hoping and praying that this is the last for you, that it never, that it, it never comes back. So I Me wish too. you all the best. So take care. Thanks a lot, Dawn. It's been great to chat. Yeah, take care.